Now we leave the human beings, the healthy and the sick, <laughs> we go to something completely different. Now, uh, Amir Sittenberg is from here, from the Masada Research Center, from the MOP, and he will talk about terrestrial microbiomes. Okay. So, hello. Uri is always a tough act to follow, so hope I can keep the, the level. So as uh, Eliora said, I work here from across the hall with a few other colleagues who will also present today and in the upcoming days. And I'm going to talk about <coughs> holobions. And uh, um, I'm going to overview a few of the things that we do instead of uh, zooming into one of them, just to, uh, like, uh, just to give you like a, a, an overview, as I said, of what's going on, but also to show you that the concepts and the me methods that we use are really transferable between very different systems and can be useful in many different contexts. Wrong way. So symbiosis is uh, really at the heart of the, the issue. And we, for years, we've used to think of symbiosis as a bilateral thing. We, we have a host and we have a parasite or we have two coexisting organisms that benefit from one another. Um, okay. Uh, a few examples with microorganisms are uh, Vibrio shiloi, which is considered to be one of the factors responsible for coral bleaching at the top. Or we have Wolbachia, which is intercellular, intracellular a uh, symbiont of many, of many insects and nematodes, and it really uh, tempers with the behavior of these animals. For example, this uh, leaf miner here, we can see that on the left and the right, we have uh, a leaf miner with Wolbachia, and on the right, we have um, one without Wolbachia, and we can see that the mining pattern on the leaf is completely different, and it affects their mating, and it affects their behavior in many very different ways. So this is sim relatively, I mean, Wolbachia is not simple, but in the terms, of, in the conceptual uh, level, this is a simple symbiosis. Uh, enters deep DNA sequencing. Uh, uh, so all sorts of DNA sequencing methods that allow us to really recover the, the depth of DNA that is present in environmental samples. And when I say environmental, it can be the soil, it can be root, or it can be, as we saw earlier today, it can be the human skin, it can be poop, it could be all sorts of things. Well, poop is not environmental, but conceptually, it's for this method, it's the same. And we can really learn about biodiversity and uh, evolution and uh, population genetics and uh, biochemical things that go on in the sample from this data in ways that we couldn't before. What we have here at the top is from a paper that really revealed to us the extent of unknown diversity of uh, bacteria that exist in the ocean and the geographic range. And it was really eye-opening in the sense that we didn't know most of it when it came out. So I'm, I also want, this is an opportunity to bring up a cost action group that I'm now uh, a member of that is uh, going to uh, make an effort to get genomic tools into the hands of practitioners that deal with, uh, with uh, ecosystem management and uh, ecological uh, conservation. Because these tools, as I said, they, they are really uh, powerful in, the, in providing a lot of information and uh, producing uh, realistic management plans for, for these ecosystems. So we, here we focus at the moment, we focus at the biodiversity level and we also look at in situ biochemical function. Uh, and, and this is what I'm going to talk about so now, from now on. So the holobiont concept, or really hologenome, which is similar to hologenome, but not exactly the same, coined by uh, Eugene Rosenberg from Tel Aviv University some years back. And this concept uh, urges us to look at an organism, or be it human, or uh, be it a tree, or some, any other animal, or a nematode in the soil, look at it as, as an ecosystem in which all the organisms, the symbionts that 
that it hosts or in its environment actually interact. And then instead of looking at one interaction at a time, we have to look at everything together. If you will, we, if you will, we have to look at the interactions between the interactions. We can't understand one interaction without knowing anything, uh, every, nothing about uh, what's going on in this ecosystem. Um, so what do we actually do uh, using this point of view? So uh, we have, I'm going to talk about three, three very different systems. What, uh, two of them has to do with the skin. We also do skin microbiome uh, studies and we look both at human skin and fresh, uh, freshwater fish skin uh, where it's, uh, the skin microbiome is particularly important in terms of uh, protection against pathogens uh, from the environment. And we also look at root knot nematodes and the environments. These are very important plant parasitic uh, nematodes that uh, cause a lot of damage in agriculture. So and now I'm just going to touch in the time I have left in uh, the various uh, the SD3 systems. So we recently have been looking at uh, Darie. It's a gen mostly genetic uh, skin disorder. And the work has, uh, is in collaboration with uh, Professor Emilia Khodak from uh, the Rabin Medical Center. Uh, it was started by Michael Brandwein, who was a PhD student here. And most, more recently, uh, uh, Rivka was a, a, who is our lab manager, and Yosef, who is a research assistant here, has been working on it. And what we see here, that even though it's a, it's a, skin, it's a genetic disorder, we see some interaction with the microbiome in this, does this work? No? But, okay. So we can see that although we don't have clear clusters, we have an area here which is mostly orange and it represents uh, people with uh, a severe state of the disease. So we see some, in, some connection between the microbiome and the state of the host, the, the, the human. And when we look at the bacteria themselves, we can see some shifts. I'm not going to go into it, but we see shifts that we would expect in, in taxa that change, bacteria that change between healthy and diseased skin. Of course, we don't know the cause and the effect. It could be a result of the deteriorated environment, which is the deteriorated skin. But there is some interaction there that we need to uh, keep looking into. Uh, another uh, study that we do on skin, which is slightly different, uh, has to do with an in situ uh, ex vivo model of skin that we use here. We, we have, and Guy, I assume, will talk about it uh, more extensively. We use skin remnants from uh, plastic surgery that we use to do experiments here. And uh, to be honest, this is the only system in which we actually have been able to get some biochemical insight to see exactly what the what the, or the two organisms in this case what they are doing on the biochemical level. What we did here is we infected these are skin pieces. We infected it with malassezia. Malassezia is a fungus that's uh, very common in many disease states, including some forms of skin cancer, and. We've uh, studied the gene expression, so we wanted to see what genes operate or what genes are expressed or overexpressed when we put them together uh, compared to the, their uh, existence separately. And what we see in short is that we get an overexpression of ribosomal RNA genes that are involved in inflammatory response. So ribosomal RNAs are not only uh, part of the ribosome, they do other stuff, it turns out, and one of them is interfere with inflammation in various ways. And in the malassezia, we see um, um, an overexpression of uh, post-transcriptional uh, protein modification genes and of uh, secretion-related uh, uh, proteins. So uh, it's starting to make sense, and we need more data here as well. And this is an ongoing project as well. Last thing I'm going to to talk about is the, an entirely different system. Now we're looking at the environment, we, we're looking at fish in nature, and this study has to do with 
skin of uh, fish in freshwater uh, in the in freshwater system. Uh, we we also sample in this region where we have obviously not in the Dead Sea, but the surrounding um, springs may have some fish in them, and this is a part of this project. But as of now, we we have data for the northern part of the system around the Sea of Galilee. We've collected fish from all these places and we checked their, their, micro, their microbiome to see if there is effect of the species and the water chemistry on the community. So, and this has so far only been done uh, in the ocean or in the sea, also in the Mediterranean Sea, not so much in freshwater, uh, in freshwater where the chemistry is, uh, is different. So what we saw that uh, the fish species, we looked at multiple species that occupy various places, and what we saw was that the fish species is very important, uh, more, in, more so than in the sea or in the ocean, uh, in determining the skin microbiome. So it's, uh, uh, the, it explains 20% of the variance, which is a lot compared to what we see in the sea or in the ocean, in, in, uh, in uh, sea water. And we also see that uh, the more the, or the less salty the water or the fresher they are, the, the, the fish itself, the species is expressed more highly, more strongly in the resulting microbiome. So uh, this, is, this was done in collaboration with uh, Yaron Krotman from NPA, the Nature and Park Authority. And my colleague Ashraf is, uh, is also working on uh, on fish microbiome in different systems, and we also collaborate on this. And uh, I forgot. <laughs> so one one last thing, uh, which is again very different, but we use the same concept, the same lab techniques to look at this system as well. And as I said, uh, I'm going to mention root knot nematodes. Uh, root knot nematodes are a devastating plant pathogen that is. Uh, very detrimental for many crops throughout the world. Uh, it's it's a f the few species that are most prominent, prominent they are found almost all over. They are very similar genetically, and they are uh, a worldwide problem. We can see the uninfected eggplants that are slightly higher here, and this ye yellowish short bunch over here are infected. What's what makes it a very interesting and complex system to look at is that root knot nematodes occupy, have several life stages, it goes in this direction, which occupy both, the, some of them occupy the soil, other occupy the roots, and uh, so we have different environmental influences in each and every step of their life cycle. And what we were able to do with uh, the same approach we've been talking about uh, today, not only in, uh, in this talk, is we've been able to see the dynamics of the most important bacteria in the different parts of the system, in the different parts, in the different stages of the life cycle of the nematode. What I'm showing here is just an example where you can see that uh, bacteria in, in healthy parts of the roots are very different and have different dynamics than bacteria in uh, galls that are parts that are infected by the nematode. We can also see which bacterium uh, picks up at which part of the life cycle, and it's different. For example, this, these bacteria that eat eggshells of the nematodes, they only pick up after the female has laid some eggs. So this is very informative in uh, uh, finding candidates for biological control and, and uh, knowing when to use them. Sorry, and as an example, uh, we were able to isolate some of them. In, in this case, we have a Pseudomonas bacterium that we found to be very highly associated with, with the infective stage of the nematode. So we were able to isolate it, and what we found out is that it was also very attractive to the nematode, and it's not unknown bacteria that are able to to, to secrete some cues that attract their uh, host. So this is probably the case. And we now think that it might be a useful tool uh, to use for biological control to find out this, uh, this attractant that the bacterium is secreting and use it as a tool to disorient the nematode in the soil and, and reduce uh, 
its infectivity, and every little help, every bit of uh, reduction is helpful with this nematode and in, in the increase of the yield. And so, moving on, we have two additional systems or two additional projects in mind in collaboration with people who sit here in the room. We would like to look at the microbiome of uh, and the nematodes that are found in uh, riverbeds of ephemeral streams in this region. Uh, ephemeral streams are, the, are really the backbone of the ecosystem here, and, and the soil microorganisms and microfauna are very important for everything else really, the plants and anything that use the plants. So this is a key thing to, to study and we know almost nothing about in this region. And we heard a lot about uh, skin microbiomes here, but uh, we haven't heard a lot about uh, the viruses that uh, occupy the skin, so we want to, to check this as well. And we have uh, Frida Benami here, and uh, Eliora and Uri who, who are present here. And this will be led by, uh, uh, by Marianne Roniger, who, who works here but is on maternity leave. Um, that's it. And that's it for me, I think. Let's see, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Amelia. This was a very diverse. Yeah. Talk, which is very good because we could learn the things that you're doing. Okay, okay, but the questions are more important than they. Yes, oh, uh, Ori. So Ori is going to ask me a hard question. <laughs> uh, about the molecule, uh, I think it's a molecule. The, whatever the Pseudomonas secretes that uh, disorients the nematode, do you have any any plan on how to isolate it, how to identify it? So th there are very there are many procedures that are in place to do this type of thing. You see, you get the secretions into the medium, then you do a rough uh, fractionation and you test the fractions and then you use some more sophisticated equipment to narrow it down to specific molecules. It's, uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.